Schachmatt. Okay, my friends, welcome to this chess video. And this is a follow up video to the first one we did in Pawn Wedges. In the first one, we saw that White was able to realize the advantage of the Pawn Wedge. Well, in this video here, we're going to try to demonstrate how White plays against having a Pawn Wedge. Played in Moscow in 1923 with the white pieces is Grigory Levenfish and with the black pieces is Ilya Khan. And after d3, the d4 pawn crosses the demarcation line in the centre, kicks back the knight and restricts the dark square bishop here. Queen to c7, knight b to d2 and e5. And you can see that black has fabricated for himself a pawn wedge in the centre. His long term goals would be to play a move like f5 and e5, e4. And if white does not want to suffer the chess equivalent of asphyxiation, well, he's really got to try and do something to prevent this idea. Otherwise, he'll simply get suffocated. He plays a3, simply taking away the b4 square from the black knight. And we have knight to h5. Perhaps portending an immediate f5. And here white plays an excellent counteraction to black's plan. He plays the move e4. Taking the sting out of a move like f5 doesn't make any real sense for black to take en passant because, well, simply increases the scope of the dark square bishop, which is his main goal in creating the pawn wedge in the first instance. We have bishop to c8, improving the position of the light square bishop, which lends itself to black's idea of playing the move f5. The problem with this is, is it's just a little bit slow. And White is able to realise his own ideas because of this. Rook comes to e1. We have bishop e6. King goes to h1 and queen to d7. It looks like black is trying to plan a move like bishop to h3 and swap off the light square bishops. But this is already a deviation from his idea of playing the move f5. And let's see what happens. We have knight to g1. An excellent choice because it not only prevents the move bishop to h3, but it facilitates the advance of the f pawn. Which white would love to play in order to weaken the pawn wedge from the flank. Bishop to d6, bishop to c1, g6, perhaps preparing again the move f5. And here white plays an excellent move, super important manoeuvre. The knight comes to f3. And this essentially prevents black's idea of f5. What happens if black plays an immediate f5? We have e takes. E takes, sorry, G takes. The knight is able to come to G5. You can see that the bishop is attacked, the knight is attacked, and the queen is looking just a little bit overloaded. And even if black defends the bishop with a move like knight to G7, F4 is coming. And the black position is looking just a little bit suspicious, to say the least. White can probably take here, or he can even take here. He can take here in the centre. Just so many options. So immediate f5 was not possible. And if we just take that back, this is the reason why black in fact played f6. 
Knight to h4, taking control of the f5 square. Knight to e7 and f4, attacking the pawn wedge from the flank. You can see that Wyatt has succeeded in carrying out his, his idea, whereas Black's idea has failed to reach fruition. Rook came to the b-file, and here White plays an absolutely awesome move. He sacrifices a pawn on f5. And his idea is simply to try and gain access to these light squares in the centre. If you can gain access to the light squares in the centre, it will neutralise the effect of this quite powerful pawn wedge. Let's see if he's able to realise this idea. We have g takes on f5, bishop comes to h6, knight goes to g7, e takes, knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes, and the knight comes to f3. You can see already that these light squares have opened up just a little. What white needs to do is exchange off the pieces which control these light squares in order to gain, get access to them. In the game, white actually played here bishop to e6. If we can just take that back, if he tries something like bishop to h3 instead, this illustrates the point excellently. Because after knight comes to h4, bishop takes, queen takes. So you rook to f7, white exchanges off another defender of the light squares. And these white pieces are able to come into the centre and make use of these weakened whoops, light squares neutralising the effect of this pawn wedge. It's quite amazing. But in the game, White actually played bishop to e6 because, well, a move like bishop to h3 and exchanging here, it simply just helps White. Sorry, Black played bishop to e6 and exchanging here simply helps White. We have rook to f2. Preparing to double rooks on the f-file. Knight to h4, taking control of the important f5 point. We have b5, rooks are doubled, bishop to e7, defending the pawn. And bishop takes here on g7, removing another defender of the light squares in the centre. King takes... Knight to f5 comes with check, the king goes to h8, and bishop comes to e4. Here black actually exchanged on f5. I don't think it's a good idea. Probably better to play something like bishop to here. Because exchanging the light square bishops here simply gives, as you can see, white access to all of these light squares in the centre. And what has happened is that this once powerful pawn wedge, which was reducing the mobility of the white pieces, has in fact been neutralised. And not only has it been neutralised, it's somewhat of a burden to black because it's restricting his own pieces. And play will mainly take place on these light squares in the centre and on the king's side, which is exactly what white planned when he played that excellent move, f5, trying to gain access to these light squares in the centre of the chessboard. Rook to g7, queen to d2, bishop b takes, b takes, rook to b6. And here we have a series, if we can just take that back a minute. Here, white in fact, played the move a4 and black played a5. Now why can't we take this a pawn here with the queen? Move like queen takes on a4. Well this results in a very beautiful line. 
beginning with the move rook to g5, threatening mate here on g7. The rook cannot be touched because of the weakness of the f8 square. Keep this in mind. The queen has got to come back. Bishop takes on h7, look at that. Again the rook cannot take because of the weakness of the H8, oh sorry, the F8 square. And furthermore, the bishop is threatening to come back here with a discovery on the queen. Of F5, opening up the rook against the queen. We have check here, cannot interpose itself because of the weakness here, as we've said. King's got to move, therefore. Rook takes on g5, threatening the rook coming to the f8 square. Very beautiful line here. And for this reason, well, it's a very bad idea to take here on a4. And black instead played the move, a5. Bishop comes into these light squares. Queen e7, Queen h5. And here we seem to have a series of Queen moves. Probably the players were in time trouble or they're just trying to reach the time control. And after this move, Rook to h5, White has a new plan. His plan is to play g4, g5 and Weaken the e5 point, trying to open up lines and diagonals for his pieces, probably the f file. Rook takes, rook takes, rook to d6, g4. White is realizing his idea. Rook to d7 and g5. f takes. And here, tragically, Grandmaster Levenfish, he took the e pawn. He played catastrophic rook takes on e5 and the game eventually ended in a draw he had in fact here a forced win if you'd like to pause the video my chess friends and try to work it out please do so now begins with a check rook to f8 check king is forced to g8 and rook comes to e8 and White is, of course, threatening Queen coming to h7. Black blocks the idea, but the White Queen is able to come and make use of the e6 square, threatening to come to here. Black is forced to interpose a piece, but it's no use. Rook g8, King is forced to h6, and this would have won the game. Queen to f6, checkmate. Unfortunately, Grandmaster Leaving Fish played well. He played. Rook takes here on e5 instead. And after this here, well, the game eventually ended up in a draw. But it was a very, very strategically rich and interesting game. If we could just go back very briefly. e4, preventing Black's idea of playing f5. And then this wonderful pawn sacrifice. After White is able to realise his own idea of playing f4, f5. Gaining access to the light squares. By swapping off those pieces which were defending them. The light square bishop and the knight. And eventually completely neutralising the effect of the pawn wedge in the centre. Which has now become a burden for black. So I hope you enjoyed that presentation, my chess friends. It's certainly a very interesting, strategically rich game to play through. And I hope that you can make use of some of the ideas in it in a practical sense for your own chess games. I'm not sure what we're going to look at next. I'll, I'll try and find something interesting for us. 
But suffice to say, I thank you very much for taking the time to watch this chess video. And I sincerely wish you well with your own chess. Take care and goodbye.